Sean Maxwell, on behalf of ARMA, I'd like to welcome everyone to our monthly induced seismicity webinar series. Uh, a series of webinars we kicked off in 2020 with uh, the help of Jens Lonsny and Mahdi Haddad. So great, uh, my, my appreciation to Mahdi and Jens for their assistance in, uh, in running these webinars. Um, and happy uh, 2021 to everyone. Um, so we're, we're excited today, Mike Wazinski from Miami University is going to be giving a talk on uh, factors influencing hydraulic fractures um, induced seismicity. So uh, very topical uh, material and uh, very excited to hear what he has to say. Uh, we just got a few kind of intro messages to pass on and then uh, we'll get to Mike's talk. So I'm going to pass it over to Jens to talk about the upcoming schedule. Okay, great. Um, Thanks, Sean. So we have three speakers coming up, one for each of the next three months. Um, they will be on the first Fridays of each month as we've been doing thus far, except um, as we've been doing the traditional time is this time, 10 a.m. Central uh, time, except note that there's one difference on the 2nd of April, it'll be uh, one hour later, 11 a.m. Central. Um, the first speaker, Jake Walter from Oklahoma Geological Survey, speaking about regional seismic monitoring and hydraulic fracturing with the Oklahoma um, example being the primary focus. Um, the following month, the following month on uh, the first Friday of March, Ivan Wong from um, Lettuce uh, uh, Consultants will be speaking about what used to be called the state's first primer. I guess it's now called the state's first guide um, uh, that's going to be released in 2021 sometime this year. Um, and it's it's expanding its focus beyond just class two injection wells, and it's going to be focusing additionally on hydraulic fracturing, you know, so relevant to today's uh, presentation, um, and a little bit about carbon capture and storage as, and utilization as well. And then the following month on the 2nd of April, Friday again, 11 a.m., uh, Eric Dunham from Stanford will be talking about modeling that he and his students have been doing on uh, injection-induced aseismic slip. So quite a few, quite a few good ones coming up. Good morning, everyone. This is Mahdi Haddad from the Bureau of Economic Geology. First of all, Happy New Year and welcome to the new webinar that we have, uh, the first webinar in the new year. <clears throat> uh, so as a general uh, guideline for this webinar, especially for the ones uh, who have joined us for the first time, everyone who has received the invitation email for this webinar will receive the invitation emails for the upcoming <coughs> webinars. And please do not forward the webinar invites. In, instead, forward interested parties to the committee of this webinar, me, Jens, and Sean, uh, in order to be added to the distribution list. We all want to grow as a community, and uh, we would like to take care of this list uh, to grow in this community. And uh, everyone, uh, and, and, and also we, we have so far around 458 people in this list. Uh, almost equally divided between academia, industry, and regulatory agencies. Uh, so it, it's a great uh, combination of all of this, and uh, we uh, anticipate that there will be a lot more interest in these sectors for, the, uh, for this webinar. Everyone will be muted during the talk, but after the formal part of this uh, webinar, you, you are welcome to answer <coughs> and uh, have some networking or uh, asking questions verbally and please submit your questions during or after the talk in the chat button at the bottom of the zoom meeting window and please send these questions to everyone and also uh, upon uh, the speaker's request this zoom meeting is recorded and will be uploaded in our youtube channel without further delay mike the stage is yours You're muted, Mike. There we go. Here Great. We go. Thanks. 
So yeah, just uh, wanted to thank everyone uh, for the chance to be able to come and speak here. This webinar series has been fantastic. And so uh, I'm quite honored to have a chance to share some of our work um, with everyone. So I, I'll be trying to focus today um, on these factors influencing whether hydraulic fracturing um, induces seismicity. Uh, I always debate about whether to put macro seismicity in uh, to the title that in essence, I'll be talking about seismicity that's generally above the sort of zero size. Um, and, and the implication there being that this is gonna be seismicity yeah. on uh, pre-existing faults as opposed to um, the fractures within the, the reservoir. So, uh, you know, several folks to acknowledge in terms of uh, students uh, that have really helped uh, to participate in this and my, my buddy, Brian Curry at, at Miami uh, that have helped to do this. There are many others that contributed to this work. Um, I apologize for not uh, citing everyone here. I'll, I'll do my best as I can uh, throughout to try and uh, give credit where, where it's due. So uh, certainly when we're trying to think about and uh, this, this sort of topic of, you know, what influences whether or not um, hydraulic fracture induced seismicity is gonna occur, there, there are many uh, injection induced seismicity cases to learn from. Uh, I've, I've highlighted a variety of them here with these blue stars. Um, this includes not just hydraulic fracture induced seismicity, but wastewater disposal related, um, uh, carbon sequestration related. There are a variety of injection related uh, seismicity cases. And of course, this is just in the central and eastern U.S. that I'm highlighting here uh, with uh, Bill Ellsworth's sort of background. Um, but I also like to highlight that there are some null results as well, places where um, injection is occurring, um, in some cases at large volumes and rates, um, without um, any sort of well-recorded uh, induced seismicity. So um, those cases I'll, I'll try and touch on as well today, um, as, as I think they can be useful for, for our understanding. Um, but I did, of course, want to acknowledge that I am pretty focused today on Central and Eastern U.S., whereas there are other places um, uh, around the globe that have witnessed injection-induced seismicity. I, I'm showing uh, that sort of summary figure uh, from Ryan Schultz review paper, just looking at where hydraulic fracture-induced seismicity has been ob observed in, in various places. So uh, I also like that figure because it highlights some of the magnitudes that we're talking about, right? That um, we have some, some larger magnitudes up uh, into the fours and fives. Um, but again, uh, I generally see that hydraulic fracture induced seismicity has been smaller in magnitude relative to the um, waste disposal related um, seismicity. So I, I'm gonna try and focus my attention on a couple of different regions um, that we've been working in recently um, to try and provide some insights today. Uh, I'll start with the Eagleford area of Texas. Uh, I'll talk also about the Appalachia Basin um, and then um, towards the end, I'll, I'll talk some more about Oklahoma. So I, I only have really sort of two method slides. Uh, I'm going to apologize for folks that have not um, sort of seen my work before. Um, I, I'm really just going to kind of brush through it fairly quickly. Um, so I'll have to sort of refer you to some of our published work if you'd like to see some more of the details of, of what we've been working on. But, but in essence, much of uh, what we've done has been based on enhanced detection. So using waveform correlation techniques uh, to take a uh, paucity of events, uh, only a handful that might be detected by network methods, uh, the sort of traditional style of um, short-term average, long-term average detection at multiple stations and then coordinating between them to identify events, that when you use um, either single station or multi-station waveform correlation techniques, you can really enhance the detection of seismicity, right? So I'm showing here now going from events that were generally above magnitude two down into the negative magnitudes um, but also showing the correlation of seismicity with the time of hydraulic fracturing. Um, you can see here are the, the vertical nature to the seismicity in time here is just that uh, individual stages or sets of stages um, that are um, inducing um, flurries of, of seismicity. So again, a, a variety of things that can be learned from the detailed detection of seismicity. So that's one of the reasons we've been pretty focused on that. The other part that uh, we've worked on is just trying to help um, collect and analyze uh, well records. So just the evidence uh, that we have about the operational um, data. So frac focus has been a, a real boon to us to be able to understand when and where hydraulic fracturing is occurring. I, obviously, frac focus is limited. It's, it's not providing stage information um, and things like that, but it can help us with generally the time frame that hydraulic fraction is occurring and where, which, which wells, um, where it's occurring at. But we've tried to supplement that 
with a variety of information from state related resources. Um, and so that has allowed us to drill down a little bit deeper into the, the details of what kind of uh, strategies have been used, how much uh, volume has been injected, um, you know, what in some cases a little bit about the information of the staging. Um, so those are things that um, uh, comparing those records has helped us to feel confident uh, that FRAC Focus is giving us a good picture, but also to provide some more detailed information about the operational activities. All right, so based on that, I'm gonna jump right into um, some of the findings that, that we've seen as we've looked uh, in different places. I'm gonna start here in the Eagle Ford area uh, of Texas. Um, and so this uh, box here just shows the zoomed in area here where I'm looking at um, the, really just the wells in this area. Uh, I've highlighted um, the wells in blue. So the circles are all showing the hydraulic fracture wells in this area. The ones that are larger and, and shown in blue are ones that have been correlated with seismicity. Um, so I've I've actually stripped away the seismicity in this plot. I find it a little bit easier to see the general patterns. Also, we have a fair amount of um, location uncertainty in this area, particularly as we look sort of back. Uh, this is a time frame of 2014 all the way up to um, uh, 2020, and so um, particularly as you go sort of further back in time, the locations would, would not be great uh, for those time frames. So I think the well locations provide a, a bit more definitive aspect of uh, where are activities um, generating seismicity. And I think one of the clear features you can see with just of this well view is that, that much of the wells that induce seismicity occurred along this Carnes Trough area. Um, so this is something that we tried to highlight in our GRL uh, paper from 2019. Uh, but this has now been updated. Um, that, that paper went uh, through activity in 2018. We've updated with 2019 and 2020. And again, the, the trend has uh, remained consistent that most of the um, seismicity is being generated by wells in this Carnes Trough area. There's a little bit in this Libel County that I'll get back to uh, later on in my talk. But for right now, I want to sort of focus a bit on um, this Carnes Trough aspect. And so, you know, to us, this um, has illustrated one of those sort of ideas that I think that's been around for a while, but a little bit hard to demonstrate, is just that there is a higher likelihood of seismicity associated with hydraulic fracturing uh, when you're near sort of faults uh, that are mapped that can become seismically active. So in this area, um, what we did is we identified the total number of wells and their distance um, from the mapped faults in this area. This is the Ewing um, fault map for this area. And then we've identified which of those wells um, generated seismicity and again plotted them uh, with distance, uh, basically just looking at what is the closest distance to a fault uh, that we see for that area. So right, so if we just take a proportion of these, right, then we get, you know, what is the percent of the wells um, that are generating seismicity for each of those distances. And you can see that wells that have these smaller distances relative to these map faults are uh, having a higher uh, likelihood, higher probability of seismicity. And again, we think that this is primarily driven by, you know, what, what appears to be a seismogenic uh, aspect of the Carnes Trough area here. It doesn't mean that all faults uh, in this area would have that same activity. And in fact, when we look at other areas, we find that it can be qu quite difficult to identify which faults uh, the seismicity uh, is occurring on. In many cases, the seismicity from hydraulic fracturing is occurring on unmapped faults, right? So. Uh, we recognize that this is not going to sort of work. You just use map faults and that will tell you about your likelihood of seismicity. Uh, but this was a, a pretty clear case where um, we're seeing seismicity associated um, with a map fault structure. We think in this case, it may, may also have some relationship to the magnitude um, that the uh, one of the events that we saw uh, in the Eagleford area in May of 2018 uh, was a magnitude uh, four. Um, point oh size event. Um, and so that we, at, at this point, we see this as the largest um, magnitude earthquake that's been associated with hydraulic fracturing in, in the US. Uh, there have been several others, um, 3.5 and larger in, in the uh, Eagleford area, again, associated with this Karn trough feature. So we, we believe that um, the, the nature of this fault that's being activated um, uh, seems to be having an influence on the, the size of the seismicity as well. So we did want to note that the, the wells that were active um, yeah, associated with the seismicity were during a, a zipper stimulation, you know, sim multiple wells simultaneously active, um, and that uh, the, the surface trace of the fault uh, comes right uh, up to the toe uh, of the well. I've tried to just schematically illustrate this um, using a figure from Pathak uh, 
um, that sort of shows the, the target here, Eagleford, uh, with a well coming uh, from the south to the north, and that the seismicity appears to be occurring uh, associated with that. Again, we don't have a great location on that earthquake, but uh, our schematic model would be that that earthquake is occurring uh, just below um, that, that area, pretty close to that fault structure, right? So again, we're on the sort of southern end of this Carnes trough feature. All right, so you know, again, there have been several studies recently. I wanted to uh, touch on this other study by uh, Dave Eaton's group, um, looking at you know the, trying to estimate what are the relative importance of different factors in terms of the seismicity. I wanted to try and highlight this one because uh, it found that the map faults in, in this area of um, British Columbia and Alberta, this is the Montney uh, formation here that's being targeted for oil and gas activities, that um, in this area, uh, it's not distance to map faults uh, that is a strong uh, future here, but instead uh, the distance to the Cordillera belt, right? That in essence, a, a proxy for the strain rate. So being that this is an area that's closer to tectonic activity, it appears in this case that perhaps that stronger variation in the strain rate uh, is having a stronger influence on whether or not wells are, are generating seismicity, right? That we're seeing more of them over towards uh, the Cordillera in front. So, so again, I think in a place like the Eulfer where we're much further away from a tectonic boundary, that perhaps uh, the variation in strain rate is smaller, that then these other features um, can, can play a more dominant role, right? But again, I'm already trying to illustrate that um, what, what seems to be a dominant feature in one region is not necessarily the, the case in others. All right, I wanted to take a little bit closer look um, at another region because we have a little bit better recording um, in this area of the Harrison County area of Ohio. We've got a uh, station sitting right above um, where the seismicity occurred in this case, so we can look a little bit more at the depth distribution. That Eagleford area, I was really just speculating uh, at this point in terms of where, where that's occurring in terms of depth. But here, I think we've got a little bit more definitive nature to the depth. Um, so in this area, we're, we're performing some more detailed location uh, analysis with uh, double difference. We're using a, a locally determined velocity model along with that local network that uh, this, the triangle here is showing the, the closest station to, to where the seismicity is occurring. We're refining the arrivals uh, using the waveform correlation to try and improve the relative locations. And generally what we find is that all the seismicity that occurred in this area uh, was in with, within one kilometer uh, of the active uh, part stimulated stage of the well, right? So the stages are sort of color coded here. So you can sort of see from beginning to the end uh, of the stimulation, right? You can see the different laterals with different colors indicating just the time frame of when they're being stimulated. And you can see that there's a correspondence in the color, right? There are stages here that correlate with that seismicity, stages here that correlate with that seismicity, right? Uh, again, I, I would argue that this is still a fairly muted version to what Jamie Rich showed uh, in the last webinar. Uh, but again, what we can do with um, the data we have in, in Ohio. Uh, but again, I think we see some similar patterns to what was seen there, um, that there are these parallel uh, east-west bands that are optimally oriented um, relative to the SH max in this area. So in essence, these appear to represent this pre-existing optimally oriented set of micro faults um, that are having uh, strike slip um, mechanisms on that. We do have a, a focal mechanism from this area that, that demonstrates that st strike slip nature to it. As I mentioned, one of the key things we were looking for here is to try and get a better idea on the depth distribution. And we, we find that there are two groups of seismicity um, based on the depths. Uh, we find uh, the shallower group and this deeper group. Um, in the shallower group, um, we found that the seismicity patterns there are a little bit different. The seismicity tends to be smaller magnitude, so generally less than a magnitude one. Um, the, we found that the frequency magnitude distribution there is a little, little different than we expected. Um, the, there tends to be a relatively high B value for those um, uh, for that seismicity. And when we talk about B values, uh, again, from the frequency magnitude distribution standpoint, that means that there's sort of less larger events than we would expect for the number of events, right? A high B value means sort of deficient in large magnitude events, given the number of events we have. Um, the other uh, aspect that we noticed about the seismicity in this area is that the sequence has stopped um, when hydraulic fracturing ended. Um, so pretty abruptly that once the injection stops, the seismicity stops. You can even see that relative to staging in a lot of cases as well, uh, when we have that information. Um, and then we also noticed that the wells that induce this seismicity uh, they tend to be uh, pretty good in terms of their gas production, uh, relatively low amounts of produced water, which is in con contrast to the wells that generated 
um, this deeper seismicity down here, right? Uh, I'll start with this bottom bullet here. These wells produced um, more water uh, and less gas production. In essence, not as good for production quality for those wells that were generating this deeper seismicity. The deeper seismicity had a couple of um, opposite patterns to the shallower seismicity. This tended to have the larger seismicities. So in many cases, seismicity that grew uh, up above a magnitude two, we saw um, uh, the B values that are relatively low, so less than 1, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. And so that then was sort of a more large events than you would expect given the, the number uh, of events. Uh, and in this case, uh, we also found that seismicity would continue uh, after the hydraulic fracturing ended um, and would sort of decay like an aftershock-like sequence. Um, so again, several different uh, sort of patterns. Um, so that um, led us to want to look at the literature to try and better understand what's going on with these two different patterns. Um, we found a study by uh, Thomas Gable and others that examined the fault, uh, effect of fault maturity on seismicity with some lab measurements. And we found that this study uh, helped us a lot, was trying to understand what might be going on in terms of these seismicity patterns. And so in that study, they were looking at um, uh, differences in the rock type in terms of what kind of uh, seismicity would be generated in the lab, where um, they're looking at sort of immature uh, rock types where they have newly fractured rock um, that has not had uh, slip across it yet and that when they do create slip across those um, planes, they would find uh, relatively high B values deficient in the larger magnitude events, uh, whereas material that had the surfaces polished to try and represent more mature fault surfaces that have had large amounts of slip on them, uh, those tended to generate um, lower B values, um, could generate larger magnitude events, um, so again, this to us made some sense given the geologic history uh, of the Appalachia Basin area that we were looking at, right? That the, the shallower seismicity that was essentially occurring on less mature Paleozoic portions of the fault. Um, and so the, that less mature, you know, and when I say less mature here, I'm thinking of it geologically, right? That we can know the sort of geologic history of this area and that there have been few sort of de deformation uh, episodes you know, for those Paleozoic rocks. So the, the portions of the fault there should be more immature. Um, and so that could help with generating the, the smaller magnitude events, the more limited magnitudes, uh, as well as the high B values. Also, you know, when you think about the, the rock types there, um, particularly shales, you, you would anticipate that things could be more ductile there. Um, and so that could explain why we're not seeing seismicity extending after the hydraulic fracturing um, is done, that in essence, the, the rocks are too weak to be able to preserve that differential stress. Whereas the deeper seismicity that's occurring uh, on more mature Precambrian -pre faults um, that, that could produce then, so the events that would have larger magnitudes and the lower B values. Again, the idea, this is also more rigid um, rock type here and so could um, preserve that differential stress that would allow for uh, a decaying sequence after the hydraulic fracturing um, is done. So, you know, once we sort of identified that there, there appeared to be, you know, sort of um, a difference in terms of whether or not seismicity was occurring down on the, these deeper portions uh, down, particularly within the basement, we started to look uh, for evidence that the basement mattered in terms of whether or not we were able to observe uh, induced seismicity. And so we used that sort of distance between where the injection activity uh, was uh, and the basement as a potential proxy um, for how close we are to mature faults. Um, and so this was consistent with one of the key observations we had made is that um, essentially all of the hydraulic fracture wells targeting the Marcellus in, in Pennsylvania um, had not observed um, any induced uh, seismicity. Um, and so, you know, observed at the sort of magnitude one and sort of higher that we could sort of detect. Right, um, and so that was consistent with the in, in Ohio, where they're targeting the Utica Point Pleasant formation. That's a deeper formation, significantly closer to the basement. Particularly once we improve the basement model, right? So the gray here, the darker gray, is trying to show how we were able to sort of collect geologic data, well drill data to to improve what the basement model was. And at that point, we could see that yeah, there's clearly a difference between where the Utica wells are targeting and the and the Marcellus. Um, as well as the wastewater disposal information, right? That the wells that were targeting the deeper, um, the uh, and wastewater disposal wells uh, targeting much closer to the basement were ones that were more likely to generate seismicity than those that were targeting shallower formations. So we tried to expand our look for this uh, property to other areas of the mid-continent. 
Um, so we looked at the Illinois Basin uh, as well as the Williston, Williston Basin. Uh, I'll, I'll just kind of show a zoomed in view here of the Williston Basin area, right? Just trying to highlight that there is plenty of injection activity in this area, right? So the, the circles here that are all sort of shaded in, in blue like colors, those are the hydraulic fracture wells. Uh, the color here is just trying to show the, um, the distance between the well and the basement. Right, so generally uh, one kilometer or larger um, in the vast majority of those wells. And then the triangles are showing wastewater disposal wells that are even shallower. They have colors over here that are in the sort of two to three kilometer um, above the basement, right? The other feature that I, uh, I thought was important about the Williston Basin is that it provided an opportunity to look at whether or not um, salt um, formations would, could, are part of the reason why distance to basin would matter and that if there are salt formations in between the target formation and the basement that might provide um, a seal that would prevent fluids from being able to reach down to the basement. But in this area, you can see that the salt does not extend to the southwestern area here. So it gives us a chance to really see whether or not um, the salt was playing a role or not. But in essence, this in the Wilson Basin area, I'm sure many folks know, the seismicity in this area does not appear to be related to oil and gas activities. There, there does not appear to be sequences when we looked at the detail of, of the seismicity that were correlating with the hydraulic fracture activity in this area. So when we try to sort of compile all of that information together in terms of its proximity to, to the basement, what we're looking at here is the, the number of wells uh, just in a sort of histogram form relative to the basement, right? So the further up here, the further up in the sequence they are relative to the basement. Right, and so then this plot shows the number of those wells um, that induced earthquakes, right? And you can see the wells uh, that are producing seismicity are generally deeper here, closer to the basement, right? And then when we take a proportion of these, right, we can come up with a percent of wells um, that have induced seismicity, right? And you could see that the proportions are larger and in particularly grow as you get closer um, to the basement. So again, you know, things on the order of 10 to 20% is your, if you're very close to the basement, shrinking down to just a few percent uh, as you get closer to a kilometer above the basement. So again, this gives us some, some notion that, that, yeah, it does appear that proximity to basement works in these sort of more stable areas where um, we're further away from um, uh, the tectonic activity. Uh, it does appear that how close you are to those older, uh, more mature faults uh, down in the basement would matter. Uh, this isn't so obviously the only areas, uh, a nice study by Polly et al, looking at the Duvernay area, uh, trying to understand what are the sort of influences on seismicity there. Uh, and they also found that proximity to basement um, was the sort of highest imp importance in their factors that they looked at there as well. So, so again, just another indication um, that this uh, is pervasive in, in areas, um, particularly when you're not near a tectonic fault zone area. So we also wanted to look at this um, property in uh, the Oklahoma area. So I'm gonna shift some attention to the Oklahoma area for a moment. Um, and so a pretty vast uh, amount of seismicity and, and hydraulic fracture wells to look at in this area. The Temple matching, you know, in this area that, that Rob Scomo led um, helped us to get, uh, you know, seismicity uh, in, in the order of a couple hundred thousand. Uh, but much of that is up here in the wastewater disposal area, but yet still provided, you know, useful seismicity for us to try and understand the scoop and stack area, as well as the Arcoma Basin uh, over here. So the seismicity that we looked at is primarily from the 2008 to 2016. Uh, although I would uh, note that Julia Chimetta's group has looked at um, hydraulic factor induced seismicity since that time as well, uh, with continued patterns similar to what, uh, what you see here, that, that in essence, a variety of regions that are seeing hydraulic fracture induced seismicity in this area. So what we found particularly intriguing is that when you look at the sort of wastewater disposal related seismicity, it does appear that the proximity to the basement does correlate with seismicity. The, the Hinks et al. paper, I think shows that quite nicely. Also, we've seen regulations associated with, with plugging back um, relative to the basement to, to try and reduce the likelihood of seismicity there. Um, but when we looked at this in detail um, in, in the scoop and stack in Arcoma, we did not find a correlation between uh, the proximity um, to the basement uh, and the likelihood of hydraulic factor induced seismicity. So I want to show a plot that, that shows how we tried to, to look at this um, from a log logistic regression point of view. That in essence, you know, I've plotted that Appalachian data that I showed earlier, just sort of histogram form. 
I'm now just plotting it in the logistic regression form showing that, you know, as you are at smaller distances to the basement, you see higher probabilities of seismicity. Uh, but when we attempt to look at that um, in the Arcoma and the scoop and stack areas, um, we do not find that trend where there are higher probabilities uh, strongly at um, uh, closer proximities to the basement. Um, so we were a bit puzzled uh, by this um, at first. Um, we did notice though um, that depth uh, in this case is mattering. So we, we looked at this just in general, what are the depths of the wells uh, and does that correlate with whether or not there's seismicity and yes, the deeper the well, the, the higher the likelihood of seismicity. Uh, but we could isolate, so there are a variety of formations being targeted um, in Oklahoma. So we could find this even when we would uh, target a specific formation, right? So looking even just at the depth of a formation that's being targeted, we saw that the deeper that particular formation is, um, the higher the, the likelihood of seismicity. So um, in that sense, you know, we saw that both in the Arcoma and in the scoop and stack that um, that depth of the well there is 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 important um, in, in these areas. And um, we noticed that um, in the Wajanaska uh, and Eaton paper, they also saw this to be a strong factor in the Montney area, that this was the sort of second highest uh, feature of importance that they saw where injection depth um, was, was a key feature in that study as well. So, so we've been trying to explore, you know, what might be uh, a reasoning why the well depth would matter, particularly if it's not proximity to basement. Um, so uh, we, we think that perhaps a, a way to understand this would be, uh, we noticed that there was also uh, an increase um, in um, the observed pore pressure gradient with increasing depth uh, of the well. So again, focusing on just a single formation, the Woodford, you can see as the well, um, as the formation gets deeper, um, the pore pressure gradient also gets uh, larger. And so we, we attempted to plot that out here in this graph as well. And, and we tend to see a, <coughs> a similar pattern um, to that pore pressure gradient uh, that matches the, the increase in the probability of the seismicity. So, so again, we think that perhaps this is one uh, way to explain why deeper wells um, are, are more likely to generate um, seismicity. It could be that they're closer to uh, the threshold for pore pressure to induce seismicity, to, to reach that sort of threshold where um, we're, we're lowering the effective stress enough to be able to generate seismicity. Um, so that's one uh, reason. I think there are a couple others. Uh, I've, I've had some folks note that um, we're also expecting temperature to increase as you go deeper into the basin like this. So there could be a couple of other features that are at play here as well. But from a sort of logistics point of view, thinking about depth of the well, I think uh, is important in terms of the likelihood of seismicity. All right, another key feature that we wanted to look at in this Oklahoma area was the influence of the injected volume on the seismicity. And part of this was motivated by Ryan Schultz's uh, work of the science paper in 2018, highlighted how there was a pretty strong correlation between the cumulative volume observed at a seismogenic pad um, and the cumulative uh, seismic event count, right? So uh, a pretty clear indication that the more volume, the, the more seismicity. So we tried to look at that um, in the Oklahoma area, um, as well as we, we tried to incorporate the um, findings from the Duvernay, as well as the Eagleford area. I'll talk some more about uh, the Eagleford specifically here in a minute. But, but again, trying to combine multiple different regions together, we found uh, a bit of a contrast here that um, certainly in the Duvernay area and also in the Eagleford, that wells that had sort of larger volumes um, also tended to have a uh, higher likelihood of seismicity. Um, but we did not find that trend in, in Oklahoma. Um, and, and that's not from a lack of uh, wells to, to look at, uh, you know, with uh, several thousand wells to look at. Um, uh, and also, you know, you get some idea about our sort of uncertainties based on the, the span of those colored regions here in the logistic regression. But what we noticed is that um, the, our, the Oklahoma area, the Arcoma and the Scoop and Stack that we're looking at there was generally wells 2016 and prior, which tended to be more isolated wells. So not multi-well pads. There were a handful of those um, in the data set, but uh, in essence, you know, a good um, 80 to 90% of the wells were, were single well pads in the Oklahoma data set that we looked at. So we tried to look at, can we isolate that um, in, in the other data set we had access to in the Eagleford, you know, could we just look at pads with single wells on them and see whether or not there's a volume trend there? Um, and so that's what we did here with the Eagleford, uh, where we're just looking at isolated um, single well pads. And you can see, uh, in essence, it starts to look a lot more like the, the Oklahoma uh, 
patterns, right? So it appears that the multiple um, wells on a pad are having an influence uh, in, the, in these other two regions. So from there, we started to think about, you know, what, what are, what's going on when we're looking at non-isolated pads? And we saw sort of two potential scenarios, right? It could be that on a multi-well pad, uh, they're, they're stimulating multiple wells at once. Um, so we often refer to this in our paper as the simultaneous um, wells, but we're envisioning that most of these wells are being done as, uh, if not all, are being done as this sort of zipper strategy. So alternating stages um, between wells. But we're, we're referring to them as simultaneous because you know, multiple laterals are getting in, injected into uh, in roughly the same time frame. Um, so to us, that sort of matters in terms of how much fluid is being injected into the subsurface. The sequential sort of term we're using here is where a full lateral is stimulated uh, and then the next lateral is stimulated, right? So sequential meaning that we do one lateral and then we do the second lateral and then we do the third lateral. So isolated meaning um, the once a lateral is completed, uh, there's a significant time frame before any other activity in the area, right? And so this graph is just trying to show the relative uh, probabilities of seismicity for these different strategies, right? And just showing the significant um, higher probability for the simultaneous or the zipper strategy, right? That it's three times more likely than, than to have seismicity than an isolated. And even relative to the sequential, where again, these are both multiple well pads, right? But it's the sort of um, injection strategy that's differing here, whether or not they're being put down uh, simultaneously, you know, multiple laterals at once or one lateral, then the next, then the next. So to us, we think that th that sort of highlights how injection rate is, is likely one of the, the more important factors, right? So what we tried to do for the Eagleford, were, where we had cases with more simultaneous strategy, we could look at um, injection rate by looking at the amount injected per day um, per area, right? So trying to sort of estimate an injection rate for a, for a given spatial area. Right, and so when we do that, we find that certainly wells that have higher, uh, sorry, areas that have higher injection rates um, tend to have significantly higher si uh, likelihood of seismicity. So, so again, we, at, at this point, it seemed to us that the injection rate seemed to matter more than the injection volume. Uh, and our sort of most recent results from the Live Oak County area of the Eagleford, so it's sort of the southwest area of, um, of that Eagleford play that we've been looking at. Uh, we noticed that that area only started to generate seismicity in 2019. So our, our first study in, in GRL did not sort of capture this, um, and that's because the seismicity hadn't occurred yet. So uh, what we were found particularly interesting about this area is that the amount of um, volume of fluid injected uh, between 2015 and 2018 is about 40 million barrels, uh, and then the same, roughly the same amount had been injected during 2019 in the first part of 2020. So you could see the, the uptick here in the curve, right? That there's a higher rate occurring, right? But the, during the same volume here, we're not seeing any seismicity as we do during the, that volume being injected here, right? So that to us sort of indicated that there, you know, the injection rate seems to be having uh, a certain, uh, having a significant um, influence on whether or not seismicity is occurring, right? That we're seeing a lower rate um, in that area, in that time frame prior to 2019. Uh, I did want to note that we, we checked to make sure there's no change in the spatial distribution, right? That it's not that during this time frame they've changed to sort of focus in on a particular area. The, the wells that are generating seismicity during this time frame are, are co-located with other wells uh, that did not generate seismicity during this time frame. So it seems to us that perhaps there's a, a particular threshold in terms of the rate, the injection rate, for when um, the se seismicity starts to occur. Um, and so, you know, to us, that started to help us thinking about hypotheses where, you know, perhaps it's when the injection rate um, exceeds the reservoir's ability to diffuse that fluid pressure, right? Um, that, to me, that would be sort of why the, the rate uh, might matter, right? That the volume may not matter as much, right? Again, it's just how, you know, if there's time for the, the volume to diffuse, you know, you may not sort of reach that critical uh, pore pressure threshold um, that, that can allow for slip to occur, right? But if it's occurring at a, a relatively high rate, um, that may exceed um, that ability for the, the fluid pressure to diffuse. So again, a, a sort of conceptual model that, that we're trying to work through. Okay, so um, that's, uh, that's what I have for, for today. And so I just you know, wanna try and reiterate some of those sort of key influences that we've seen as we look um, through um, our studies, right? That um, we think that proximity to faults uh, is a key factor, but uh, certainly it does appear that 
Um, this is limited by our ability to, to, to map faults uh, that are active. Um, you know, again, I think that area in the Eagle Ford that we've seen, you know, strong correlation with uh, proximity to faults. I mean, that, that appears to be a, a pretty strong fault. Uh, sorry, uh, well mapped, uh, significant vertical offset on it. The seismicity that's occurring um, being induced uh, is uh, normal faulting seismicity. So I think some of the struggles we've had in other places are that the seismicity that's occurring is strikes up mechanism, uh, which makes it harder to sort of identify um, faults, uh, you know, using 3D seismic to try and capture some of those. Um, but we also think in, in, in areas where it's sort of uh, more stable, um, perhaps harder to identify faults, uh, proximity to basement could be uh, a useful factor. But again, we saw in Oklahoma, it doesn't sort of work everywhere, right? Uh, that uh, it appears that in, in the Oklahoma area, there are faults that are up above the basement that are able to generate seismicity as well. Um, we, we did try to highlight um, that fault maturity um, likely influences um, the nature of induced seismicity. Uh, it seems that we can, see, we can observe sort of larger magnitude seismicity when uh, the faults are more mature. Obviously, sort of identifying, you know, which faults are more mature and less mature is a pretty hard uh, thing to do. But we, we wanted to try and highlight that we think that's having a, uh, a real relationship to whether or not we're observing induced seismicity. Uh, we've seen now in a couple of different studies that well depth uh, appears to be a factor that influences uh, whether or not you're going to generate seismicity. Um, we, we suggested that perhaps that sort of overpressuring uh, associated with the, the poor, poor pressure um, uh, ratio, that, that's, that's potentially a reason for this. Um, but again, I think there could be a, a couple of um, reasons why that could be occurring. Uh, and then we, we also touched on here at the end that injection rate uh, seems to correlate with seismicity uh, more than the in injected volume. Um, and so we think that perhaps that indicates the hydrologic properties influence um, when the induced seismicity is occurring, right? So again, trying to better understand the, the hydrologic properties uh, of the reservoir where the, the water is flowing into the faults would be great. But again, we recognize that's a, that's a more difficult observation to make as well. All right, so uh, I was gonna go ahead and stop there um, and provide some time for, for question and answer. Well, that's great, Mike. Uh, thank you very much for the, the presentation. Uh, a lot of really good observations and material and uh, a lot of good points for discussion as well. So uh, appreciate that. Um, and I, I meant to mention during the, the introduction and I'll say it now while people can uh, add to the, uh, the questions on the chat, but um, <coughs> Peter Smiley through the ARMA sent out the, the meeting invite to the entire ARMA uh, membership group. So if anybody's attending this webinar that hasn't uh, attended previous ones or hasn't received the invite directly from Madi, please uh, get in contact if you want to continue and be on the distribution list for uh, future webinars. We're uh, more than happy to accommodate you and add you to the distribution list. But uh, and, and welcome to uh, any any of the ARMA members that aren't uh, normal participants in this webinar series. Um, great, so let's get on to the, uh, the Q&A. So I'm gonna start with uh, a question from Ryan Schultz. So he's, he's wondering about the Harrison County uh, example, the, the PNAS paper, and it might be easier if, yeah, if you wouldn't mind sure. Mike, back to that, that plot. So it's the the double yeah this one the double difference and Ryan's noting that uh, the in certain areas it looks like there's some stages skipped and uh, was that in reaction to the seismicity or was that an indication of issues either drilling or uh, completion related in that area? So my understanding is that it is related to um, uh, the regulator work the operator and regulator working together to try and mitigate the seismicity. This was a case where the seismicity was large enough that the regulator was involved. Um, there were, as far as I understand it, um, there was a change in operation where they moved from the southern wells to the northern wells. Um, there was also some reduction um, in in volumes and pressure, uh, as well as a few skip stages that you can observe here. So so yes, this. Uh, as far as I understand it, this, this is a scenario where um, there was uh, uh, cooperation between the regulator and the operator um, to try and mitigate the seismicity in this area. Great. And uh, I guess maybe I'll invoke chair privilege with this particular plot up and ask a question myself, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so, you know, you, you kind of nicely allude to a number of factors that, uh, that could control seismicity and uh, 
Um, you know, I think what you nicely showed, Mike, is every every area is different and probably individual faults within a given area will probably respond very differently as well. But to me, this this particular plot kind of nicely illustrates that it's it's really proximity to those seismogenic features that's really kind of driving the, the response. So so Mike, could you comment if you with with that in mind, if you looked at um, some metric, if it's volume being pumped on whatever pad or whatever time interval, is that really kind of the important parameter or is it really where you're pumping that that's that's gonna cause the seismicity? Yeah, to me, I, I have a hard time separating the two, right? That I, I think, you know, uh, both appear to be uh, necessary, but but not individually sufficient would be sort of the way I've generally thought about it, right? That if you're if you're not near a seismogenic fault, uh, you, know, uh, you know, for example, you know, in the Bakken area, you can you know you can inject at significant rates uh, and not see any seismicity, right? But um, it, it does appear in other areas, you know, for example, that that uh, Live Oak County of the Eagleford, where you know th there was injection for several years. You know, without any seismicity, right? Um, and so it seems that once the rate hit sort of a certain level, that that's when the seismicity kicked in. We we look closely to make sure that it wasn't, you know, just that they weren't in the right spot to be able to get the seismicity. But but no, that they they were 2019. They were coming back to the same spots they were in, in previous years. So to me, it feels like there there is you know sort of multiple conditions that sort of need to be met. For, for us to observe this type of induced seismicity. I know that makes it more complicated to mitigate, but <laughs> certainly that's what, what it appears right now. Great, and so obviously there's a lot of questions around uh, around basement, so I'll try to kind of group them together here. Sure. And, uh, um, so Jeff Nunn uh, is asking, uh, what the vertical distance between basement and seismicity and wells is, how long does the seismicity continue after completions? Um, any thoughts is maybe to generalize that proximity to basement, you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but is that going to control the duration of the seismicity once once something's activated as well? So that so that question is a pretty good one in terms of you know how long the seismicity lasts. Uh, whether or not it's related to how close you are to the basement. At this point, I have not, um, you know, I don't think I have a good enough set of observations to be able to explore that idea well. Um, in, in this particular area, you know, we saw, uh, you know, in essence, the wells are of equal distance to, um, the, you know, the, the seismicity that generated um, in the basement. Uh, we, in, in one case uh, over here, we're seeing seismicity that lasted uh, four or five months um, afterwards uh, with a really productive sequence, whereas um, seismicity over here uh, lasted only about a month and significantly less productive. So to me, I, again, I think it's, it's probably going to be related to, you know, some form of heterogeneity uh, in, the, in the basement in terms of whether or not those um, differential stresses can be preserved, um, you know, how much sort of a stress was built up uh, on those features sort of to start with is probably going to play a role there as well. So um, I have yet to see a clear indication of, you know, can you map out, you know, how close you are to basement and how uh, much of a um, aftershock sequence you would get from, from these cases. Um, but thus far I have seen that, yeah, it, it does appear to be the deeper seismicity that, that tends to have these sort of more drawn out sequences, um, but I haven't sort of seen a, a particular nature to, to that. Um, in terms of the vertical distances between the seismicity and the wells, um, I think that's probably best shown um, you know, here where we're, we're generally seeing um, seismicity is occurring you know, if um, the wells are within a kilometer um, of, the, of the basement. Um, Again, we're seeing higher proportions of the wells. The closer you are to the basement, the higher the proportion, the more for a given set of wells that you would see induced seismicity in. Um, but we do have a couple of cases where um, things are uh, higher above the basement. And then, of course, in Oklahoma, you know, we, we're, we're not seeing this strong trend there that it does appear we're having cases where wells are, you know, a couple kilometers above the basement um, that, that are generating um, seismicity. So, 
so again, it, it's not an exclusive uh, relationship. The, the cases we've seen in the Appalachia Basin that are sort of uh, further above the basement, uh, that's associated with the Rome trough feature. So uh, again, appears to be a, a more pervasively faulted um, uh, stratigraphy that, that in those areas. So again, I think it gets us back towards the, are there seismogenically active faults in those areas? And if they're above the basement, uh, you, you don't need the proximity to the basement. Great, and Andrew Newton asked a good question, should have started with this. Um, when you say basement, what's your definition of this? Is this Precambrian crystalline rocks or? Yeah, yeah that's generally what I'm using uh, here for uh, the mid-continent areas where we have fairly decent uh, maps of that. Again, uh, my colleague Brian Curry uh, took the lead on that aspect of trying to stitch together um, the the state based uh, survey maps uh, of the basement structures, uh, but yeah, they're they're generally defined in those cases as the as the Precambrian crystalline rocks. Um, again, I think there are you can get into a pretty quick argument about you know uh, why wouldn't the sort of deepest uh, sort of rocks uh, in the Paleozoic section also be able to generate seismicity? Uh, those 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 can be uh, just as rigid as the Precambrian. Uh, crystalline basement. Um, but thus far, it, it does appear in, in those more stable areas um, that have had less tectonic activity over time that uh, it does appear that the, the basement rocks seem to be key in those areas. Okay. And then <clears throat> I guess one more question related to the basement from uh, Yusin. And I'm going to apologize for the last name. I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce it, but Grigorat. <laughs> I'll say it fast and maybe that'll help. <laughs> um, apologies there. But um, I, to kind of summarize a high level of the question, uh, it's really about the depth accuracy of the seismicity. So, you know, you're talking geometry of the wells relative to kind of a map basement, but what about the depth of the seismicity? Are you seeing, do you think there's a lot of moment release actually taking place within the crystalline basements or? Well, yeah, so in terms of, you know, the hydraulic fracture induced seismicity in, in Oklahoma, it, it, it does not appear to us that the seismicity there is exclusively in the basement. Uh, again, uh, the, there are sort of, uh, perhaps the best thing to do is just to refer to Jamie's talk from, uh, from last time, right? I think that his, the data he showed is probably the best I've ever seen and continue to be convinced that, that yeah, you do not need to have basin involvement to have um, hydraulic fracture induced seismicity. I think, you know, the indications they are showing there with the sort of private array that shows um, that, you know, again, there's a little bit of a bias in the public uh, surface arrays to, to sort of indicate that the seismicity is a little bit deeper, that even if I were to argue based on the data I've seen that it's down in the basement, it's probably a little bit um, biased downward than, than it actually is. So um, certainly I, I would agree that in terms of the hydraulic fracture induced seismicity, it appears that a significant amount of it is um, in, in the sort of rocks above the basement in, in Oklahoma. I mean, again, I think that raises some questions about why is that, right? Is what, what is it about the faults there that are different than some of these areas like the Appalachia Basin uh, or, or even in the Williston where, you know, we're, we're not seeing those cases where uh, seismicity is occurring uh, significantly above the basement. Um, again, it, it seems to me that, that perhaps the tectonic activity associated with the Wachita uh, is is uh, significant relative to what we see, you know, from from some of those Appalachia Basin, um, you know, tectonic building episodes over time. That it, it does appear that um, the the tectonic uh, orogenies in the Oklahoma area have had have had more success at generating seismically um, active faults than than some of these other areas. Okay, good. And then moving on, Priscilla Nelson asked a question, I'll maybe expand it a bit. She, uh, she's wondering about comments on horizontal stresses and principal stress orientation, and maybe add to that deviatoric horizontal stress. And um, I, maybe the context of the question, this is kind of my editorial around it, is maybe more targeting why, uh, why a red basin like Williston Basin doesn't have seismicity associated with it. Could it, could it be a stress, stress effect or? What do you think, Frank? Right. So, you know, again, I, I I think it's, to me, it's whether or not you sort of believe the sort of map fault catalogs are uh, significant in terms of, you know, whether, you know, again, I think the argument that you could make potentially is, right, well, if there are no optimally oriented faults that, you know, you wouldn't generate any seismicity. I think that's a fair argument, right, that in essence, pretty much each of the places I showed today 
the when we have sort of good trajectories of the seismicity or or sort of known faults that that are uh, being activated, you know, they are optimally oriented in the in the stress network, right? So it does appear that optimally oriented faults appears to be a key component of of this system, right? I guess I. I have yet to be convinced that there aren't optimally oriented faults in a place like the Wilston Basin um, th that you know can't be activated uh, given the, the injection that's going on in in those areas, right? Um, that you know some of the sort of 3D seismic images I've seen suggest you know you could you could have a mix of different sort of fault orientations in those areas. Uh, again, part of the issue that again we continue to struggle with is the, the types of faults that we want to see in some of these areas. Uh, would be strike slip in nature, uh, you know, again, given the work that Jens has done to show that certain areas uh, that were interested in the central and eastern US, the sort of uh, current stress orientation would promote strike slip faulting, um, you know, again, trying to identify those faults uh, in 3D seismic is pretty tough. Um, so, you know, again, whether or not those those faults just don't exist in a place like the Williston Basin, I, I have yet to be convinced uh, of that. Um, but again, I think it's, it's on the table as, as a possible reason why there, there's less activity there is that there just aren't optimally oriented faults, right? But, you know, in the place that we're looking at, you know, where the Utica formation, uh, you know, is being targeted uh, in Ohio, you know, um, you know, we don't have maps of those faults uh, that are being activated, right? You can see in that sort of uh, view that I showed, you know, the, those little micro faults, you know, in this area of, you know, Harrison County, right? None of these faults were mapped. There, are, there aren't any sort of fault structure maps that show those sort of east-west orientations. Um, so, you know, again, to me, it, it's it's not that a map fault catalog would would help you to know whether or not there are optimally oriented faults or not. Um, so, and Mike, if I can interject one thing yeah. about the stress, too, um, I think that there's a, a a widespread view, and I would argue that it's sort of a misconception about the Williston Basin having low stress anisotropy. This has been a view that many operators have had for a long time, but you know, our, our work mapping the state of stress there shows pretty high stress anisotropy. It's a normal strike slip faulting environment. And um, you know, why there's so little induced seismicity in that area is I think more related to some of the factors that Mike's talking about. Not, not so much stress, uh, a lack of stress anisotropy. I think there's plenty of Plenty of reason to expect anisotropy. I mean, we see drilling induced tensile fractures and that kind of thing there in, in well bores, for example. Thanks, Ed. All right. Well, we're reaching the end of the hour. So I think what we'll do is kind of formally wrap this up. And uh, on behalf of the committee and ARMA, I'd like to thank you, Mike, for the, the excellent presentation. And uh, I think we'll take you up on your offer to continue the discussion because there's a number of uh, number of questions we haven't had a chance to, uh, to get to, but if anybody needs to jump off, I just wanted to kind of more formally wrap this up and just remind everyone, the next presentation is gonna be by Jake Walter from the OGS, uh, be a deeper dive into what's happening in Oklahoma. So I'm sure uh, looking forward to a, another very interesting talk. So it'd be February 5th. And again, uh, if you're receiving the, the meeting invites directly from Madi, you're on the distribution list and you'll continue to receive them. If not, send us an email and we'll more than happily put you on uh, the distribution list. So thank you to everyone. And uh, Mike, I can hear the, the virtual hand clapping taking place. <laughs> I appreciate uh, everyone uh, logging in today. Uh, it's been it's been great to have a, a nice audience to, to listen to what we've been working on. Appreciate it. And I, I like, uh, Sean said, uh, I'm happy to continue working through some of these questions here. Um, I appreciate all this. Uh, questions and answers are, are great. I, you know, it gives me a chance to sort of hear um, perhaps what, what I may not have made clear, but uh, also just to see what's on people's minds. So I really appreciate the time people take to, to add some uh, questions. It's, it's really great. Now, I'm, I already saw the next question in the chat, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to admit at this point, uh, I don't know the Alan Makari uh, study, so I'm, this is, I already have homework to do after I, I get off today. Um, but, you know, again, the, the comment here, uh, uh, you know, it, it does sound to me that um, the, that study is uh, suggesting a similar relationship to what we've been seeing in terms of uh, that injection rate influence, right? If, uh, if they're seeing pressure change, uh, rate of pressure change on the magnitude distribution. Uh, that, that sounds like the kind of thing that, that we've been seeing evidence for. So, um, uh, 
I, I'm going <laughs> to make sure to follow up on that. Uh, if, if there's uh, someone that wanted to sort of weigh in uh, that knows that study better, please feel free. Yeah, and again, anyone uh, feel free to, during the, the formal session, we like to keep everyone muted so we can kind of organize it and keep the questions flowing and kind of integrate as possible. But uh, Pierre-Francois, if you want to unmute and talk more about that, you're welcome to. You know, uh, thanks, Mike, and, and thank you, Sean. Uh, it, it's just uh, an interesting because uh, what, what they did was looking at, you know, uh, rate and state faults uh, behavior under injection conditions and looking at heterogeneity along the fold. And so that ties in with your comments on both the, uh, you know, the, the, the injection rate on one hand and the fault maturity on the other hand, in my opinion. So it's, it's, it's interesting how, and the fact that it's, you know, fault scale versus, you know, reservoir scale, or if you will, basement scale. So I, I thought that it was interesting. And I think, yeah, if you have the occasion to read it, it's a, a Journal of Geophysical Research, 2019. I can send the reference if you want. Um, sure, yeah, that'd be great. Right. Uh, I mean, I, certainly, uh, I've got it. <laughs> I got it marked down already. I want to make sure I don't miss it uh, after this. But I appreciate you bringing it up. I, I agree. I, you know, again, I, as you saw today, right? I don't have a single answer to you know how how do we figure out which wells are more likely to generate seismicity. There, there are several features at play here. Some of which I think are quite geologic, right? And so, uh, you know, hearing about a study that's trying to look at you know some nature of how faults slip, uh, but recognizing their heterogeneities on these faults, like, again, you know, as a geophysicist, I always have to be cautious about not treating faults as some uniform plane, uh, right? And so uh, I think that's a component of what's happening here. Right. All right. Thank you. Sure. Right, so I see the next question uh, is about um, carbon synchronization induced seismicity. Um, and so, you know, obviously, uh, this can, you know, our ability to sort of analyze that is limited at this point, right? I know there are a lot of studies that are trying to sort of anticipate, you know, what uh, the relationship is going to be, you know, as um, we ramp up on carbon synchronization injection. Um, but I, I think at this point, the, you know, the, the ideas are, you know, to try and choose reservoirs um, that are well isolated um, and and that have, um, you know, a relatively well known set of hydrological properties. Uh, again, a lot of work's going into sort of trying to characterize the reservoir for carbon sequestration. So, you know, my my thoughts on on that in general are, I'm hoping that we're going to learn a little bit more about the relationship between hydrologic properties and the uh, the nature of induced seismicity, you know, from injection, fr from those, uh, from those studies, from those experiments, right? So I, you know, I, um, I'm keen to learn more about the, you know, as Forge, the uh, Forge project rolls out, uh, you know, trying to see what's going to happen there, uh, and you know, again, a, a number of other places that are exploring this, right? And so to me, I'm, I'm keen to sort of learn a little bit more when we know better things about the reservoir. How does, how does it respond to injection? I think that's that's gonna help us with some of these ideas about to what degree um, do, do injection rates matter? You know, is, is that just some kind of proxy for what's happening geologically um, in the reservoir? Um, so, you know, again, in terms of, you know, fault maturity associated with those reservoirs, I, again, I think, you know, there's perhaps an opportunity to better understand the faults um, that are involved in those areas. But again, I think many of the scenarios that folks are trying to sort of target for carbon sequestration would be, you know, avoiding faults uh, as much as possible, right? So, um, you know, again, there, there are likely going to be some aspects there associated with it. But um, my, my hope, uh, I think everyone's hope is that uh, faults can be avoided as much as possible. Um. Uh, okay, so I see the next question here is about um, potential mechanism of stress relaxation and long-term production of a reservoir um, on induced seismicity. Um, yeah, so I, you know, the the idea of stress relaxation, I, I've I've tended to think a bit more about it just in terms of understanding some of these aftershock-like sequences. Um, so I, I've been thinking more about it in terms of you know differential stress that's that's um, either existing in the system to start with, you know, from long ago tectonic activity or, you know, from the actual earthquake to earthquake interactions, right? That um, I think I envision that the, the sort of decay of seismicity after 
hydraulic fracture induced seismicity um, is, is primarily earthquake to earthquake interactions, right? That um, how quickly that sort of differential stress can be dissipated gives us some clues about, you know, how the rocks can, can relax uh, the stresses. Um, but I guess I haven't then tried to take that idea and take it to a sort of more broad sort of idea about the sort of uh, reservoir in general in terms of how well um, an injection reservoir. I, I think you're envisioning here a bit more the um, disposal related reservoirs and how, how well that the stress can be relaxed in those cases. I guess I've been thinking a bit more about sort of localized feature as opposed to a sort of broader one. Um, so, but you know, again, to me, there, there should be some relationship, right? So, you know, it seems like trying to look at these sort of cases where we have some clues as the, you know, sort of seismicity decays or, 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 you know, how abruptly it decays, you know, might give us some clues, you know, about stress relaxation, at least when it comes to uh, differential stresses that, that generate seismicity. But it seems to me that it should provide some broader in, in implications on, on how the reservoir is gonna behave. Um, but again, I think, you know, the, the work I've seen modeling wise to try and look at, 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 at that sort of longer term production and, and relaxation, you know, again, uh, the, the reservoir modelers are, I think are trying to look at those sort of broader, um, you know, sort of scenarios than, than I am. But I think perhaps there's an opportunity to try and integrate those two views um, together. Um, so I haven't really thought a whole lot about it, but I like the idea of trying to look for some interface between those two. Hey Mike, just on that theme, going back to your uh, your initial discussion on uh, sort of event to event interaction and kind of the relaxation of the seismic sequence, could there be a relationship between that and fault maturity? Have you looked at that at all to see uh, presumably a smoother versus a rougher fault is gonna, gonna relax in a very different way? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, at this point, I think there are, those variables are conflated, right? That the the sequences that we've seen, you know, generate those sort of aftershock-like sequences where we can sort of know where they are depth-wise, particularly in the Appalachian Basin. You know, they're also on the rocks uh, that, you know, would potentially be you know, sort of more crystalline, more rigid. Um, so I, at this point, I, I don't feel like we've been able to sort of separate those two ideas. Is it more, you know, a, a rock uh, rigidity aspect or is it more of a heterogeneity based on, you know, the fault maturity? Um, so, you know, again, I think we'd have to try and grow the data set of observations to try and see if we can untangle those two. But I mean, look, that's a great question about whether or not we could get enough uh, observations to, to try and separate them. Yeah, I guess I'll just make a sort of an editorial comment. So based on my day-to-day -day observations of some of our inventive with operations in a number of different reservoirs that you kind of touched on today with uh, the seismicity issues. And uh, it's interesting that usually the top of everyone's mitigation approach is to take an operational pause. And that pause has a very di different influence, even over a short er interval that could be, you know, we have examples within a couple thousand feet where one fault, you stop fracking and the seismicity almost immediately stops. In other cases, it can have, uh, have uh, more ongoing seismicity and, uh, um, so trying to understand that is certainly something that, uh, that we've been looking at a lot internally. Uh, Sean, would you be able to say a little bit about whether or not you've seen differences in the magnitude patterns um, of the seismicity, right? So to me, you know, if there is some relationship to maturity there, it would argue that the ones that tend to have more aftershock-like sequences would also tend to have sort of the lower B values and sort of higher uh, max magnitudes. Have you, have you seen any of those kinds of relationships? Um, somewhat. So probably some of the larger events we've seen tend to have longer sequences. Um, but uh, in other cases, we've seen you know, quite, quite relatively large events with uh, almost nothing afterwards, even, even with uh, very dense sensitive recording, just nothing happening afterwards. So you know, we're trying to develop kind of operational tools to try to leverage that to know when, uh, when to, and how long to extend that operational pause for, uh, for the seismicity to stop. Yeah, it's a good, con I appreciate you bringing up the context there, right? That trying to, 
sort of know how long to pause for, you know, it is dictated a lot by, you know, to what degree does the seismicity continue after injection? Um, and yeah, at this point, you know, I, I don't think we have a great conceptual model for what, what, you know, why is it happening in some cases and not in others? I think you, you've highlighted it pretty well with the anecdotal observations there. And, and I think, yeah, I mean, you know, we tried to highlight, um, in, in Ryan's, in Ryan Schultz's, uh, you know, led the, our review paper effort, you know, we tried to highlight in there that there are a fair number of these cases that that have seismicity that extends afterwards. Um, but again, I don't think we have a great idea yet what sort of controls that. Um, so perhaps as, you know, our data set grows, we can sort of explore it a little bit better just to, to see. But um, I think, yeah, there's, there's likely some understanding we can unlock in there. Um, hi, Mike. Um, I think my comment was slightly misunderstood. Sure. My point was about wastewater disposal. I didn't talk about hydraulic fracturing sure. for Oklahoma at least. Um, but I actually agree with you that the Hinks et al. study is, has some conclusions that I couldn't verify and I don't think the depths of the OGS catalog can support it. So I kind of agree with you that the distance to basement in Oklahoma, this relationship is not clear. But I, I wanted to ask you, because I really like the Delta earthquake rate in the Oklahoma hydraulic fracturing study, the way you try to define this for the associations. And then I saw that you changed that for West Texas. And to be honest, I couldn't understand the equation. Like, I think maybe some of the notations are not explained. Can you try to explain why you had to change it? What's new? Um, something in, along these lines, just to understand how these associations were made. Right, so, you know, I think what we're, <laughs> what, what we've struggled with in a number of cases is um, the hypocentral uncertainty, right, that, you know, how well you can set up a correlation algorithm between seismicity and hydraulic fracture wells, or or really waste disposal wells would be the same. But I, you know, in essence, you know, hydraulic fracture wells we tend to sort of target because they have shorter time frames that they're active, so you can sort of better identify correlations based on space and time. But the, the problems we've run into are, you know, if there are uncertainties associated with the the earthquake locations. Um, it, it makes it harder to establish those correlations, right? And so in many cases, we've had to try and tweak our algorithm to try and, and sort of account for um, the differences in hypocentral uncertainty, right? So, you know, one area is going to have a different hypocentral uncertainty than another area. And so that, <clears throat> that's been generally one of those primary drivers on why we've had to tweak the, the dials a little bit um, on, on those um, uh, algorithms. Um, the other nature that we saw certainly in West Texas is the density of op operations, right? Um, and so, you know, again, when we were looking at, um, you know, operations, you know, in uh, the early uh, teens uh, in Oklahoma, you know, the density of operations did not really approach what we've seen in West Texas. So that was another, factor that influenced, you know, um, how, how we wanted to adjust our algorithm to, to account for that. Um, so uh, you said, I, I, I'd be happy to try and sort of talk to you a little bit more about sort of the, the detailed numbers on, on the algorithm. I probably don't want to get too yeah, but deep into that on there, but uh, would be better. Sure. Uh, but yeah, thanks for the clarifications. <laughs> and there, there are differences, I agree. I'm not sure that the Oklahoma depths are super accurate. And I, to be honest, I hadn't understood that you are using hypocenters and not epicentral, epicentral distances. So um, yeah, we can follow up. Sure, let's do that. Thank yeah. you for the presentation though. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, hi highlights, you know, one of the issues that, uh, you know, uh, uh, is we tried to highlight in that review paper is that, you know, our ability to look at any of these kinds of correlations is completely dictated by you know how good the earthquake catalogs are, how good the well catalogs are. You know we're we're all sort of working with imperfect data, um, so trying to capture as much information as we can. Um, and so again, I, I tried to look. I, uh, I'm a researcher. I tried to highlight my own research, but I tried to sort of allude to several other studies that have 
done similar kinds of work trying to establish these correlations, some of which have similarity to what we've seen in our studies, some of which had differences. Um, so I, I, I tried to be uh, fair about that and, and in, in doing so certainly didn't capture, you know, different algorithms were used to establish correlations throughout uh, those different studies, but um, hopefully that folks can sort of follow up on I some think, of them. I think it's clear in your paper that did, you did change it. I'm not, uh, I, I think that was clear. I didn't understand the motivation exactly and how this change solved the issue, but uh, I, I, I will clarify it once I understand the equation. Sure, of course. So Mike, there's a couple questions from Timothy Davis, so maybe you can invite him to unmute himself. And uh, one of them is on basement and why basement matters, I guess. Hello, good afternoon, morning, whatever time it is. Yeah, Mike, <laughs> great, great presentation. Thanks, Tim. So I had, I had two questions, one about basement and, and these may be pedantic geologic questions in here, but to me it's, it's kind of important is, is really, what are you talking about when we're talking about the basement? Is it a lithologic difference or is there a significant mechanical difference between the cover sequence and what you're describing as basement and what makes it significant in terms of the earthquakes? So, yeah, so in, in areas like the, the Appalachian Basin, I mean, yeah, this is a, this is a rock contact that we're, we're talking about Precambrian crystalline basement. So, uh, there's both an age difference uh, as well as a rock difference, right? We're talking more about uh, metamorphic uh, crystalline rock as opposed to uh, sequences above it that are more sedimentary uh, and younger. Um, to me, to me, I think the biggest difference, so do I believe that there's uh, differences in rheologic properties? Absolutely, right? But I think in this case, what, what the sort of seismicity pattern differences suggest to me is that um, th there is a difference in the in the history uh, of the fault um, maturity. Basically, there's history of fault motion difference based on the age, right? So the the Precambrian rocks have had multiple orogenies to to generate sort of fault slip uh, on on faults within the the basement, whereas some of those Paleozoic sections, particularly those that are closer to the target formation, have really only had sort of one. Uh, orogeny in um, the eastern U.S. to be able to sort of generate sort of fault motion. Um, and so to me, I, I think a primary uh, influence here is just sort of how much opportunity you've had to, to slip on that fault, to, to create uh, maturity, um, and then, you know, um, you know, to what degree you've been able to, you know, sort of cap, uh, hold some of that strain over time such that um, there's strain available for for this seismic activity. So well, oh, that helps a little bit with how I'm thinking of the basement. Yeah, and so that leads to my next question, which I think is, a, to me, is a bit of a paradox in here in terms of fault maturity and strain sinks in here, that over time, you would expect older faults to have matured, straightened asperities be gone versus something that's very, an immature fault in which you still have bends and tips and things like that where you would have had larger strength sinks. So at failure, why do you not see bigger events or more events with the less mature faults? Right. So to me, this is where the lab study that, that I referenced in, in, the, in, in my talk is, is where I got insight. I, you know, I, I think I was leaning a bit more the way that you were thinking of it. Um, but the, the lab study showed us that um, the sort of newly fractured rock that has a more heterogeneous surface um, is limited in terms of the, the size of events that can occur, right? That, that in order to get sort of larger magnitude events, you need a smoother sort of surface, uh, broader sort of, of uh, you know, uh, surface that can host um, strain accumulation and then release. Um, and so to me, that the sort of more mature, the, the smoothed out faults are the ones that are allowed to sort of generate sort of larger and larger surfaces that can host um, seismic activity. Um, so, so I tend to think of it as, um, you know, the, the, the sort of heterogeneity along the fault surface um, as, as what's helping us to, to, to build up to sort of larger magnitude events that we could observe. Um, I, again, it's, you know, areas that have sort of new, newly generated sort of fault surfaces can have all kinds of 
sort of earthquake-like phenomena on them, but they'll be just too small for us to observe, right? And so a key for us is that we have this observational threshold that we can sort of only see seismically the, the ones that sort of reach large enough uh, to be observed up here at the surface. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mike, Mike, I would like to add another thing. How about the low friction minerals? The other thing is, if we have a uh, uh, schist uh, with low friction uh, within the fault zone uh, in Texas, uh, one of my colleagues uh, was able to observe some of these low friction minerals in the fault zone. Well, certainly, I think you know the you know if we're talking about Precambrian basement that's going to have metamorphic rock uh, in it. Um, the nature of that metamorphic rock is going to matter a whole lot, right? The, whether or not we're talking about nicens or schists, uh, it's going to it's going to play a significant role, right? And so, again, you know, there aren't a whole lot of basement cores to look at to try and get a sort of good feel for what's what does the basement rock actually look like in in these areas that we're sort of seeing the seismicity. Um, but it does appear that. Um, of the core that I have seen, um, that there, there is a fair amount of heterogeneity um, and there do appear to be sort of, um, you know, uh, fracture zones, fault zones uh, that have, you know, um, you know, more, more just like sort of material sort of in those fault zones. But again, I think, you know, when I, when I describe some of these sort of differences in, in terms of smooth fault surfaces, right, I'm, I'm, I'm falling into the geophysicist trap of thinking of faults as just some kind of planar surface, right, where the geologists all tell us that there are fault zones, right, uh, and I have to sort of continue to think of it that way, right, and so to me, you know, what, what might sort of better represent a mature fault zone is, is, is truly the, the nature of that zone, right? Like how, how wide is it? Uh, how localized is it? Um, you know, again, we, we would anticipate some nature of, um, you know, aligned uh, minerals, uh, you know, ground up uh, in a gouge zone uh, along a, a fault in the, in the basement. Um, but, you know, so how localized it is versus how spread out it is, um, you know, how, how, um, how well aligned that material is would all sort of provide some indications, I think, uh, about how mature um, that fault is. But uh, Amadi, you've certainly pushed me into <laughs> to the edge of my comfort zone. Uh, uh, you know, again, I've, I've tried to sort of incorporate, you know, a geologist, a geologist way of thinking of, of faults, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a transplant graft on my brain. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. So I have another question. In uh, one of the slides, you showed that the trend of uh, cumulative volumes versus time changed in mid-2018. So uh, you, I think in mid-2018, uh, probably a lot of operators decided to do more stages rather than increasing the injection rate in each stage. So uh, the change in trend is probably because they fractured uh, more number of uh, uh, stages. And then the, acu the cumulative uh, stress, uh, like the disturbed stress in the region may have increased because of that larger number of stages and induced more earthquakes uh, rather than just uh, changing the injection rate within one stage. So at the end, you concluded that the injection rate is more important than cumulative volume. So, but maybe it's just the cumulative volume. It's just the stages that increase the number. Right. So I, I should, you know, I appreciate your, your comment here. So I, I should have been more careful to use uh, a term like effective injection rate. So I'm not thinking of an injection rate on an individual stage. I'm thinking of the total amount injected within a day, within an area, right? Um, yeah, that, I thought that. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah, from this plot, yes, it looks like a rate, like cumulative versus time. It's just the slope of this. But uh, maybe in a small. Right, but I think your comment is one that I don't think we've explored closely enough. Is is that change in the in the rate of injection, right? The, the where the volume goes up per time in 2019, is that due to more wells, uh, more you know multi well pads, or more stages per lateral, right? Um, I think your intuition that it's more stages per lateral, basically meaning more total volume. Per, per lateral, um, I think that's a certainly viable hypothesis. I just don't, I don't, I haven't looked personally closely enough. I'd have to ask Shannon, my student who's done a lot of this work, whether or not she's identified this. I, 
I was under the impression that there were more wells in 2019 than, than in prior years. Um, but, but again, it could certainly be a combination of, of the two, right? Um, so to what degree it's more wells versus more stages per well uh, is something that, that, yeah, we'll have to check and see. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I heard one uh, presentation in ATC 2018 by the CEO of EOG Resources, I think, and he suggested to just do more uh, frac stages and more uh, sa uh, more sand injection for higher economy of the horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. And uh, interestingly, that that follows that suggestion. I think this probably a lot of operators took that and uh, did more stages after mid 2018. Yeah, and so you know, again, we we've seen you know in the in the live oak area that certainly there was an increase in size, but it was actually zero uh, prior. Um, so this this is certainly more. Um, but you know, it it looked like in other areas, particularly in the Carnes Trough area, there there was not a significant increase in the um, amount of seismicity, uh, but there wasn't a, a similar increase in the amount of injection. The the the, the number of wells and, and yeah. volume per well didn't seem to increase in 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 the other area around the Carnes Trough. Now oh. again, we should factor in the fact that our GRL paper, you know, we we shared that sort of evidence um, that we had seen with the Texoga um, Association, you know, in mid 2019. Uh, so I think we highlighted at that point that it does appear there are significant risks associated with the Carnes Trough area. So I, you know, we, we, when we look at our data, we see a, a drop in the activity in the second half of 2019 that correlates relatively well with when we started to inform people uh, about the induced seismicity problems in that area. Um, you know, the seismicity, the injection, the amount of activity in, in 2020 started to, to come back up again. Um, but we were seeing sort of uh, relative to the amount of seismicity um, that, that there didn't seem to be a, a difference in terms of amount of injection to amount of seismicity um, during the, the 2020. So uh, it doesn't seem that there's been a strong change in the operational style at this point. But that's one of those things that we, we'd like to dig in a little bit more to try and better understand um, whether or not there's been changes. So your, your suggestion about looking at uh, stages per well is a good one. We're, we're definitely going to take a look at that to see if we can we can extract that. Thanks. Well, Mike, I, I was going to go ahead and jump off, but um, and feel free, by the way, uh, to either stay or jump off yourself. But, sure, uh, no worries. I feel no bad for the presenters when we get in this informal part that uh, <laughs> <laughs> you might be feel compelled to uh, to stick around. But uh, thanks again to everyone and. Uh, Good talk, Mike. And uh, as always, Madi and Jens, thanks for your, your help. And thanks to all the participants for uh, for attending and sticking around. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Big turnout. Um, you, I really enjoyed your talk. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Mike. You we had a, a, almost 117 people. At That's, great. Point That's great. That's uh, you know, great. Look, I, you know, again, I, I said this earlier, but I'll, I'll say it again. You know, uh, how quickly you were able to sort of organize this, you know, once the pandemic hit. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a real, a real help. Uh, I mean, look, we, we've now experienced several uh, conferences online uh, and they are, they are quite limited in their nature, right? Uh, I think we've all found them to be uh, <laughs> a, a fraction of what we would normally get from a meeting. Uh, so I felt like this style of having a sort of monthly webinar that, that generates an opportunity to talk about issues um, that sort of singular focus I find works more effectively than the sort of everything at once online. Uh, you know, again, it's just, it's hard to interact with people in those kinds of settings. Um, so, you know, again, it's not like I've had a chance to sort of have sort of side conversation with people at, at a webinar like this either. But, but again, I found there was more question and answer at these webinars than the ones I would typically see at AGU or, or, or others. So, uh, again, I very much appreciate that you guys uh, took the time to organize this. Well, thanks, Mike, but really it comes down to uh, quality of speakers like yourself. So it's really that's what's uh, driven this forward. So good. Yeah, I appreciate it too. Have a good one, everyone. See you, Sean. Thanks.
So Mike, your presentation uh, is recorded and it will be uploaded uh, within a week okay. or so, or maybe this evening if uh, <laughs> I'm able to convert the format sure. and it will be uploaded. No worries, no worries. Thank, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you guys are able to do that. Uh, there have been a couple that I have missed. And so uh, it's great when folks uh, are willing to uh, allow it to be recorded. Uh, those of us that can't sort of log in at the exact time get a chance to, to do it. So I appreciate you taking care of that. Sure. Thank you so much. Sure. I appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, right, Thanks Mike. You. No problem, Paul. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Hey, I had a quick, quick question. If you if you still have time or you got to sure. run. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, in Live Oak County, did you look at, um, I know you did the study with Shannon um, before this activity occurred. Did you look and see if there was actually HF wells being um, stimulated in the year, in the prior years? Was there any change in activity? Was there, was there a change in just, they started act, doing, acti doing um, hydraulic fracturing here? So um, we haven't looked prior to 2015, right? So, um, you know, uh, the, the time frame of 2015 through 2018, you know, that, that red curve there showing, you know, the amount of hydraulic fracture activity um, during that time frame. So there's certainly activity going on. It just seems to be, you know, there's an increase in the rate at which uh, wells are, are are being simulated during 2019 that correlates with when the seismicity um, uh, came about, right? We, we don't really see any seismicity. We've, we've looked pretty hard, too, in terms of both template matching, you know, sort of known events looking backwards in time, also some uh, repeating signal detection to try and look for events prior. Uh, but yeah, we don't, we don't see evidence of sort of missed seismicity prior. That, that seems to be a uh, a pretty significant change there in 2019 when the seismicity uh, comes about. I do have an extra slide. Let me see if I can quickly get to it. Yeah, here that shows those uh, differences in um, locations, right? So the uh, black open circles here are the wells that were active 2015 to 2018. Uh, the orange circles are the 2019, early 2020 wells that didn't induce seismicity. And then the green wells are the wells that induced um, seismicity. Um, so you can sort of see just about every one of those green wells is sort of right within an area where there were black wells. The, the one exception would be the sort of furthest um, one to the, to the southeast. But each of those other wells up here, I mean, they're right within an area that had previous activity prior to, to 2019. So there was no indication that it was a, a change in area of, of nope. stimulation. Uh, that's nope. interesting. Thanks so much, Mike. That was great. Great sure. talk. Yeah, sure. No problem. Mike, I've, I've heard that in uh, Ohio, there is some uh, criteria for the distance that the uh, stimulations can occur uh, to the fault. So what is the, is there any regulatory uh, criteria? So yeah, in turn, it, it, it mainly has to do with in terms of monitoring, right? So that um, if uh, a well is um, going to be stimulated within, I think it's three miles, uh, if I've got it right, uh, of uh, a mapped fault or previous uh, catalog seismicity, um, then uh, monitoring uh, of that well is required. Um, yeah. And so, it doesn't sort of say you can't operate there. It just means that you need to to, to have uh, you know a a uh, mitigation plan that involves a monitoring. Uh, now again, you can work with uh, the oil and gas commission to for them to do the monitoring, but but in essence, you know, some form of monitoring needs to be in place. Um, and then yeah, also to have a, a sort of plan for if seismicity were to occur, what kind of mitigation steps would you take? Um, so so, so yeah, it, 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 is there any effort to map uh, all fault within Ohio? Uh, is there any uh, like overall effort like using 3D seismic or other uh, methods to determine faults? Yeah, so uh, no broad effort uh, at this point is, is underway as far as I'm aware to, to sort of map out sort of fault structures. Um, again, you know, you know, as I'm sure you've heard in some areas in Texas, you know, right. some of these faults that get activated for induced seismicity, even when you look at good 3D seismic or 2D seismic, it's really hard to see them. Um, and, and so, you know, maybe you could talk yourself into, well, yeah, maybe there's a little bit of an offset there. 
Um, but they're often, you know, ones that you would not sort of isolate as, oh yeah, here, you know, here's one that um, th that would very clearly be a, a suspicious fault uh, beforehand. And again, I keep going back to this idea that in several of these regions, I think it has to do with the strike slip nature that, you know, again, these faults that are activated in the Appalachian Basin and in portions of Oklahoma and Texas, you know, the, the strike slip uh, fault would be really hard uh, to identify in, in 3D seismic. Uh, again, if there were strong vertical offsets that are now being reactivated as strike slip, then, you know, uh, sure, that would, that would help. But, you know, again, if they were, strikes up faults to start with, um, you know, it's, again, it's going to be pretty hard to see them in, in 3D seismic. Um, so, so I think that's why there hasn't been, you know, a big call for, you know, hey, we got to go out and map all the faults. You know, it's, it's unclear how successful that would be given that, you know, the optimally oriented sort of, you know, faults and the sort of, uh, and the, the nature of stress, you know, Yen's nap would show that, you know, strikes up faults are, uh, likely to be most active, you know, given the the current uh, SH max. So, um, yeah, I, it, you know, I have not seen a, a sort of big effort towards this, uh, but I, again, I'm not too surprised because uh, I'm not sure how successful it would be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure, sure. Guys, if you have any other questions, uh, please ask. You can unmute yourself and ask. <laughs> Maybe these guys are just. Uh, <laughs> That's all right. I, I do this too. I walk away. <laughs> all right. Uh, you know, I thought I'd hang around just to see if there were any other uh, lingering questions, but uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'll head out for lunch now too. Uh, yeah. I appreciate yeah. you uh, help, helping to organize. Mike, I really appreciate your patience. Your yeah, no worries. No worries. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Take it easy, Mike. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you, you too.